Isn't that a great video? So that's the SETI at Home project. Now let me talk about this really interesting thing that happened in 1770. It's called the Turk. There's a picture here. So the Turk was a robot chess player in 1770. I'll wait for that to sink in. And you would walk up to the robot, and you'd make a piece, and the robot would move. The hand would move and place the other piece. And you're like, wait, 1770 is a robot moving a chess piece? And so you'd play chess, and you would lose to it. You're like, what do you mean? Like, yes, it was good. It played a really good game of chess. Did somebody go back in time? Did, you know, did John Connor go back and take the AI, with Skynet, AI, you know, what, what happened? No. It was a ruse. It was a hoax. There was somebody underneath the table. You can see a picture of the person underneath the table. This person saw, probably with magnets, how the pieces for the opponent was moving, had a board down here, was playing himself, thinking about what to move, and was moving the hand with a little mechanical thing to move the piece for what the other piece should be. Totally a hoax. Look like a computer, really a human. Okay? Now, they had a lot of, uh, this toured Europe. I mean, this went crazy. And they played Napoleon and beat him. Now, if you know Napoleon, not that you would know Napoleon, if you know Napoleon, like I know Napoleon, no. Uh, it, Napoleon's not somebody to embarrass, right? Off with the head kind of thing. So I wouldn't have, that's a lot of chutzpah to play Napoleon and beat him. I would have lost. I would just, I would have thrown the game just to have Napoleon not be mad at me. But anyway, the point is, Napoleon didn't get mad and didn't find out about it. Nope. But now the sad thing is, it was lost in a fire. There's a fire in 1854 in the warehouse where it was kept. But the actual chessboard was separate and didn't burn. So we still have the original chessboard from the 1770 Turk. Pretty cool stuff. Why is that relevant, you might ask? Good question. Well, the idea that humans can do what looks like computers are doing was reinvented with Amazon Web Services and what they call the Mechanical Turk, in which humans do computation very often for things that are hard for computers to do or that you want a lot of humans to do. So maybe you're doing some social science research or psychology research and you want people to do something and you want to see how they all do it, you could use, give, there's a way, there's a kind of a marketplace where you could put out a call for participation, here's the pay rate, people can sign up for that, and then you get a ton of people to help you with your research. That's for social science or psychology. Um, you can also have, as I said, humans do things that are hard for computers. So one thing that's really, really hard for computers to do, although they're getting better, is image labeling. Here's a picture. It's a beach scene. There's a surfboard here. There's a thing. There's a half of a leg of a person walking in. Maybe there's a sandcastle. And the computer just sees pixels. And it has to determine surfboard, sandcastle, leg of a human. Okay, sunny day. But humans instantly go, like, what do you see there? I would just type things. Uh, Louis Manon is famous for Games of the Purpose and his ESP game. I believe that you've read this. If you haven't, please read that Games of the Purpose article. Talks about how two humans are thinking they're playing a game about you and I have ESP because you type a word and I type a word and whoever types the word first gets it. What, what's what, you're all, what you're actually doing is labeling that image. So I'm typing what I see. I see sky, beach. Surfboard, and I'm typing them as fast as I can. The moment you type the same word that I have on my list, it goes, ding, you have ESP. Gives you the next image. I've just, we've just added six, you know, let's say one was in common and two were not in common. That's now five words we've added to the vocabulary of things that are in that picture. Isn't that amazing? So you can do image labeling by making it, by gamifying it for humans, but by allowing humans to do that. So there's a lot of ways of coming at this. One, by making it a game, you're having fun doing it, and images are getting labeled, or you go to Amazon Web Services and say, I want to sign up to be an image labeler. And you get paid some rate, and then they ship you images, and you just type what you see in the image. If it's a sign, you write the word stop. If it, otherwise, you say uh, sunset, bird, romance. So you're just typing things that thematically make sense of the picture. Okay? So uh, missing person searches. That's another time people have used these services, where someone's missing. Um, there was a sad case where Jim Gray, one of the Berkeley alumnus, famous researcher, um, his ship was lost. His ship was lost off the west coast of California, and while he was scattering his ashes for his mom, it's a really sad story, and his ship was lost while he was, you know, having remembrance for his own mom, and so everyone woke up. Everyone in the computer science community woke up, and one of the things they did was they took the Yahoo satellite data, the kind of satellite data, the, I don't know what company that is, and they sliced them up 
and they ship them using Amazon Web Services to different people to say, look on this thing and zoom in and see if you see anything that looks like a boat. It looks like not just waves and looks like not just the open sea. So this, they used human search to help with that search. And unfortunately, they never found it. It's a sad story. Um, translation, transcription is also, also used. If you have a big document, you might pass it out. Every chapter of my thesis can be sent to people who know the two languages and transfer it over. And Louis Bonnard is actually trying to teach people how to, um, there's a company found out, I forget the name of the company. Michael, do you know the name of the company? Duolingo, thank you, Duolingo. So Duolingo is the name of the company in which you're teaching yourself a second language, but you're also translating documents at the same time. It's this amazing thing. So for free, you're learning a second language without a, without a you know, support person or paying for a course. And yet, while you're learning, you're translating documents. Because you know your language really well, so you're translating doc documents in from the other one. Um, art research. I'm going to now go to a demo real quick and show this brilliant art researcher. There's an amazing artist who commissioned 10,000 sheep to be drawn, OK? It's called the, ten, the, the Sheep Project. And he, want, he used a piece of software where he could trace the actual mouse movement. So then he could actually redraw the sheep. Because it's not just, I got the picture, his pixels. No, he actually got the strokes and the actual x, y over time. So I would be able to recreate the sheep as you change the color of the cursor and as it, I mean, of the pen as you change the thickness of the pen, OK? So let's actually show you a demo of the Sheep Project now, these are drawn by a ton of people, 10,000 sheep drawn by about 9,000 people. Some people drew a couple, got into it, right? Um, <laughs> by the way, he threw some away. Like, some people just drew a line. That's not a sheep. So the, he threw, like, 500 away, and I just randomly clicked on one or two of them. But anyway, it's supposed to show the sheep, and when it does it, it actually shows the drawing up here. It shows the actual thing. It's really cool. He also did the same thing with the superhighway. He had people draw cars and where the wheels are, and he now has an infinite movie that just takes the next person, and this is the longest continual traffic uh, single lane highway in the world. Isn't that kind of cool? So I figured out how to kind of do the wheels and anchor it so that the bottom is always there, and you just have a ton of cars. And supposedly it's never it's supposed to stop. But isn't that cool? So that was the example of the Sheep Project. Um, so as I mentioned before, some online services use the contributions of many people to benefit individuals in society. So an individual might want to pay for some work for a group work, or society might need some help, like a missing person. We need to find this person so we can get some help there. Um, crowdsourcing, and especially crowdfunding. The idea is that you could have an idea for something, and the crowd can fund you to do this idea. Then you get some small benefit, like the first version of it or something, or some, from some, some acknowledgments at the end. Um, offers new models for collaboration. You could have this idea that I need to get some work done, and I can now say, help each other, and you kind of collaborate and help each other. An example of the missing person I said. Such as connecting people with jobs, and businesses with funding. So that's the crowdfunding model. And also jobs. There are people who, who spend their life now, have a full-time career, answering the call of Amazon Web Services. right? And they'll do anything. They might know many languages. They might know how to draw very well. And as people are putting calls to do things, like transcription or art artistry, they're communicating. They're helping with that. I do know that there was a recent a collaborative work um, in, uh, 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 of animation, where they made a 3D animation. And a ton of people helped with this 3D animation, from modeling to story to all these things. And it was a collaborative work, thanks to the ease of doing that with the web. It's really cool stuff, OK? So in summary, in the topic of kind of citizen participation, there are lots of wonderful, powerful ideas when you bring the citizenry together to solve problems, to make art, and to help each other, as well as a whole industry behind it that has supported it, OK? Next time.